What's up everybody? This is Lisa Fields, the founder and president of the Jude 3 Project, and you're about to watch a conversation from Courageous Conversations 2021. However, before we get into that, I want to cordially invite you to Courageous Conversations 2022. The theme this year is the scholar and the skeptic. We're back in Washington, D.C. at National Community Church with seven amazing conversations. Conversations like, is there a God? Should we trust the Bible? Is Christianity a white man's religion? Does Christianity oppress women? Is Christianity homophobic and transphobic? Should we be spiritual or religious? Is Christianity bad for our mental health? We want to give you a blueprint on how to have courageous conversations with gentleness and respect. Remember, we sold out last time, so make sure you register early and get your ticket now. If you can't join us in person, you have the virtual option as well. Register today at CourageousCombos.org. Our next conversation is rediscovering early African Christianity. Now, if you've been following Jude 3 for any amount of time, you know that we're heavy on introducing people to the rich history of early African Christian history. And we want people to rediscover it, to not look at the whitewashed Christian history you may have been taught in seminary, but to look at the rich history of early African Christianity. We have four amazing panelists to help us with this conversation. Dr. Vince Bantu, Dr. David Daniels, Dr. Esau McCauley, and also Dr. Alan Waller. Today's panel will be moderated by Jerome Gay. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Well, good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon uh, to everyone here and to our virtual audience. We're excited about this conference, Reclaiming Christianity. Uh, before we dive into the panel, I want to give you another reminder about being able to uh, uh, text in your questions using the Q QR code or the link. Go to www.pigeonhole.at and use the code CC21. That code again is CC21. We're gonna dive right in because this is a very important topic because it has evangelistic effects. When we think about how Africa is either whitewashed or ignored as it relates to the rich African history of Christianity long before the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, so uh, Dr. Bantu, I wanna start with you. You wrote a book called Gospel Hamanote and in it you said, Ethiopian theological literature as the concept of right or orthodox theology was of utmost importance to ancient Christians of the African continent. I want all of you to take a stab at it, but I want to start with you, Dr. Bantu. Why is it important to rediscover early African Christianity? Yeah, that's, that's a great question, Pastor Gay. I mean, I, I would say just to jump it off that um, it's important maybe for, for two reasons. Number one, because uh, God made us black on purpose, uh, and he made all of us the way he made us intentionally. So sometimes we might think that racial or ethnic or cultural distinctions are some kind of just temporary reality, and I think sometimes we subconsciously think that when we get to heaven, we're all just going to be the same, Or but when John looked up, he saw every nation, tribe, and tongue, and so our diversity in the creation mandate, God said, fill the earth and, and cultivate it. And so he intended for diversity and that includes blackness. So it's a beautiful thing and it should be celebrated and known. But the second reason is because specifically black people, black history, black civilizations have been specifically targeted. And especially within Christianity, Christianity has even been perverted and weaponized against to terrorize black people. So it's even more important in the, in the writing of Paul in first Corinthians 12 to give greater honor to the parts of the body that have lacked it and to especially emphasize the contributions that Africans have made in Christianity since day one. Awesome. Dr. McCullough. Um, hello? Oh, I think that um, on a basic level, it's always important to counter a lie with truth. Absolutely. And there's a lot of people who are served by making the history of Christianity white. And if you grow up, at least what I did in a black context, there's always been kind of like the black nationalist tradition in Christianity, the secular national tradition that has said, well, you became a Christian just because of the slave trade and there are no, the history of blackness in, um, in Africa was, uh, was Muslim or was not Christian. And so I just wanna say, sometimes we have to be honest about what we're gonna recover. 
So if part of what's happening in our day is a recovery of, of the history of Africa, and we want to kind of adopt this pan-Africanism, well, I said, if you're going to go with pan-Africanism and adopt the history of Christianity, I mean, adopt the history of Africa as a part of recovering black culture in America, then you got to recover the Christian part too. And so you can't just, if you're going to take Egypt, you got to take Christian Egypt. And so what I want to say is the first thing you got to do is to tell the truth about what happened. That doesn't solve all the problems, but that's, that's one thing. So it's important to recover it for the sake of a realistic reckoning of what does it mean to recover my African heritage. Because as far back as you can go, there's some black guy yelling, Christ is risen. Um, and this is just true. So on, but on the other side, um, a lot of times the discourse, especially in some white, I'll say some, so people won't say I said all, some white Christian spaces, um, there's this idea that they're, when they talk about diversity, they're inviting the people of color in like it's theirs. But like they're not inviting us in, we were here too. And so the important part is to say, I'm not being invited to a party that you threw. Jesus threw the party. Absolutely. And we were always eating at the table from the beginning. And so both as it relates to dealing with kind of black nationalism that calls Christianity a whitewashed religion, and to look at white portions of Christianity that want to pretend as if we can only be invited if we meet their standards. And we had to say, no, y'all don't get to set the standards. God set those standards. And that's the reason why I think it's important to recover all of our history. Yeah, that's so important. Um, we know that Martin Luther, a lot of times we start church history at the Reformation in Wittenberg, but there were centuries of African Christianity that preceded the Protestant Reformation. In fact, Luther got a lot of his theology from Ethiopian Christians, uh, but they don't teach us that. Uh, Dr. Waller, as uh, a pastor of a large church, and just understand evangelism, uh, can you expound on this? Why is it important to rediscover early African Christianity? Well, again, thank you for letting me be a part of this conversation. And I agree with my brother, first of all, because it's the truth. And just telling the truth about our faith is important to, to recover our faith and to help our community embrace the faith. Then secondly, it's important because if we normalize the conversation and not trivialize the conversation. I'm, I'm a little older up here and and so um, you know when when the when those that are just a little older than I am came back in the late 60s to the church saying we've got some questions that y'all can't answer there was a departure out of the church and that departure with black men and in many cases educated just sort of said the church is not ready to answer these questions. Cornell West says in 1987 there was sort of a resurgence of the pan-african movement those of us who began to raise the question, how can we be uh, black and Christian? And then there was the trivializing of it, and so we were all doing the finding blacks in the Bible stuff. But the truth of the matter is, finding blacks in the Bible isn't the hard thing. You want, if you want a real academic pursuit, find some white folk. I mean, th that, that's the real academic pursuit. And so we have to change the conversation it's our book. It's our story. We're not a meta-narrative. We are the narrative. And so it's important because if you're going to then do evangelism in an urban context, then there are people raising the question, why does your God not look like us? And those of us now, the, the, the whole world has access to our library. So we can't hide behind lies any longer. We can't pretend like people can't find out this stuff. And if we who sit in the pulpit or we who claim to be doctors and so forth are not willing to tell the truth, we're gonna lose another generation of people. Dr. Daniels. So my, my period I focus on is the 1400s, 1500s, and 1600s. And um, one of the things we need to realize is that the slave trade was traumatic. It was horrific. But we're not merely living in the afterlives of slave trade. We're living in the midst of the rise of modern racism. And so I argue that around 1660, 1700 is when modern racism occurred. And so what was Christianity prior to modern racism? So let me just say a couple of things. One is that there were Europeans learning Ethiopian languages, especially gays, from Ethiopians in places like Rome and other places in Europe in the 1500s. Why were they learning it? 
They wanted to learn the Ethiopian Bible, to read the Ethiopian Bible. Why did they want to read it? Because they knew there were more books in that Bible than any other books. And they were trying to figure out, is there some knowledge that has been lost that Christians and Ethiopians had retained? But not only did they try to learn the language, and this is all the way up to the, the uh, 1600s that they're seeking to do that. Um, not only that, but they are also looking to Ethiopia, especially the Catholics and the Protestants, to try to find a way of renewing the church, just on the Protestant side. So some of you already know the fact that there is a person by the name of Michael the Deacon who meets Martin Luther, not in Ethiopia, but this brother travels to Germany, to Wittenberg, to meet Martin Luther in his own home place where he's living and working. And Luther wants to interview him because he wants to learn, is, in my language, Ethiopian Christianity a forerunner of Protestantism? He wants to know, is the Bible in the vernacular and not in Latin? And the brothers say, yes, it is. He wants to know, do they have communion of bread and wine, which the Catholics don't allow at that time? And he said, yes, it does. He says, are the priests married in Ethiopia? He said, yes, they are. And, and he goes down, is purgatory part of your teaching? He says, no, it's not. Um, do you recognize the supremacy of the pope? He says, no, we don't. And so he realized that Martin Luther, then, I, my argument, is using Ethiopia as a place to give an historical precedence to the biblical argument. Because the Catholics said, you're making this up. This is all in your head. And he's saying, no, all you need to do is look at the church in Ethiopia, the church in Egypt, the church in, in Greece, and you'll find out that there's historicity that's there. And I'll end with this. Not only does Martin Luther meet with him, not only is he interviewed, but Martin Luther and Philip Melanchthon write letters of recommendation. I really think it's more than that, but let's just say it's all it is. And those letters are sent throughout Europe saying when this brother arrives, Treat him as if he is somebody that you need to respect because he is. Wow. That, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, you, you know, in, in light of that, like for, for some people, a lot of this is new information. And a lot of that has to do with iconography and what we're presented with. And so um, the, the answer to whitewashing isn't blackwashing. But what, what we're saying is we need to present a full narrative. Uh, but, but I want to ask this. Anyone can take this one first. As it relates to imagery and even revisionist history, why is Northern Africa viewed or presented as Southern Europe? Did you catch that? Why is Northern Africa yeah. presented I, as Southern Europe? One of the things, and I think this goes into what happens in biblical studies, and people need to understand how blackness gets defined in North America versus what happens in the actual academy. And this gets to the thing that you're talking about. So, in America, we all know they had this thing called a one drop rule. So if you have one drop of black blood, you're black. So if you got pulled over by the police in 1930, you couldn't say, I'm mostly white, can I mostly not get hit upside the head? You were, you were oppressed, right? Now, when we then flipped over, and you, this, is all, this is in all the literature, and they're looking for the black presence in the Bible, this is the question he got to earlier, the standards flipped. So just think about this. In America, if you get pulled over, one drop, you're black. But then who's black in the Bible? Well, then the only black people in the Bible are people who look like me, the, like dark black folks. And so you had this high standard of, in order to be considered black in Bible times, you had to be Ethiopian. But if you're in America, you had to be one drop. And so what happens is, and the reason that even Northern Africa, which has a lot of Berber and lighter black people, those people were kind of raised up effectively into whiteness, or the fact that they were had any color was eliminated, while at the same time having a totally different standard of blackness in America. And so what biblical scholars did in the 60s and the 70s, which people say was trite, but it was important. We said, okay then, let's take that definition of black and say, well then, if you, if you use that definition, how many black people are in the Bible? So in other words, if those people who were in the Old and New Testament were pulled over by the police in Alabama, what would you have called them? And if you ask it that way, you get loads of black people. And so that's what you've seen, at least as a movement in biblical studies, of how we began to talk about that. And so people get mad around saying that we're playing fast and loose with the black game. But even if you go back and read the early literature, people like Cope were saying, I'm going to use this definition. Because you end up with mostly Afro-Asiatic peoples of some form in that region of the country, in that region of the world during that time period. Dr. Bantu? Yeah, definitely. Um, I, you know, I would definitely agree that 
like the way that we talk about race and categorize race today is very different than like the even you know the medieval period or the ancient period and all that. I mean, to add to that, I, I would say, and Denise Buell points this out in her book, Why This New Race, uh, you know, looking at the function of race in early Christianity that we don't even have a uniform way of talking about race in the world today. It's not like we even have one. I mean, I'm biracial. So I'm one thing in the US, like Esau said, I'm black in the US. But I go to South Africa, I'm colored. And then I go to West Africa and they're like, oh, you, you look white. And so it's, 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 it's not even like we have a uniform one today. Um, and it was the same thing back then. And so the, the kind of like what Esau was saying, you know, definitely North Africans were, were able to participate in uh, Romanitas, or be, they, were, they were part of the Roman Empire. I mean, North Africa, Egypt were civilizations that existed long before the Roman Empire, but then they were all colonized uh, right before or around the time of the emergence of Christianity. So when Christianity comes around, Egyptians, North Africans, they're all Roman citizens. But they're clearly not white by modern standards, but the tricky thing is that they were white by ancient standards. And you know, like Esau was saying, back then, a black person would have been seen as an Ethiopios, which is a racial term, it's not an ethnic term. Ethiopios just means black person, and it would get used to refer to people from South India, South Arabia, actual Ethiopia, Nubia, it was just, a, it meant black, that's all it meant. And so we really should translate their word Ethiopios as black, because that's what they meant. And that did not include Egyptians, North Africans. In fact, Egyptians and North Africans often use that term in a denigrating way. And they would often, you look at their sayings of the Desert Fathers and Moses the Black, Moses the Ethiopios, who was an Egyptian monk in the 300s and lived among Egyptian monks, and yet they clearly distinguished him from the rest of them, and they even looked down on him, and he even looked down on himself, and he called himself an ash-skinned, burnt-faced one. And then you have all other kinds of North African uh, people who are looking down on that, and they're attempting to play into Roman culture, Greek, Greek and Latin language. And you have people like Augustine and Origen that highly look up to you know, European and Roman uh, concepts. And Origen, actually, even in his commentary on Song of Songs, even calls blackness a marker of sinfulness. So they were deeply racist, North African, Egyptian, North African people, and they are today, too. I mean, let's just be real. If you, if, like, there's clear, deep race issues in North Africa today where people are more brown skin. And so I, I would say that's a large part of why it got seen that way, because at that time, you know, kind of to uh, Pastor Allen's point, in that time, also, who were the white people that we now call white? They were the, the barbarians. They were the people that lived up in northern and western Europe. So people on both sides of the Mediterranean were around the same complexion, whether they were in southern Europe, like now you got Greek and southern Italians today, they're kind of olive and brown skin. And people in northern Africa, they were, they would all consider themselves white in comparison to the black people south of there. And the white people to the north of them, they called them barbarians, but when the Roman Empire falls and power shifts to Western and Northern Europe in the Holy Roman Empire and in the Crusades, now whiteness has an even higher standard, and the people who in Roman times would have considered themselves white, which to Esau's point, today we would not have ever considered them white, Athanasius, Augustine, any of those people, if they had been driving around in Southern Alabama in the 50s, they would have been considered black, but in ancient times they were considered white, but then whiteness gains a new form and a new face in the medieval period. Wow. Do you want to address that, Dr. Daines? I was good, but, but one of the things that happens in the uh, 1400s, 1500s, 1600s is that something is uncanny. And the uncanniness is that the division is not based on skin color. The division often is based on whether you're a Christian or Muslim or Jew or not a monotheistic religion. And so, so therefore, the part that I can't understand, that's why I describe it before the rise of modern racism. Why in this period are there four people who are dark-skinned African descent, who are consecrated as bishops in the Roman Catholic Church, um, two in the 1500s and two in the 1600s, when you won't see that again for the most part until you get to 20th century. I say the rise of modern racism. Why do you have in Portugal, which is the places that is the most receptive, um, recognizing a distinction between Africans of, no of noble descent, especially Congolese, and then commoners. Commoners are the ones that are enslaved. Those of nobility are the ones that are welcome into the colleges and universities in Portugal at that time. Um, they, they, they are able to become, a few of them become professors. Some of them, like Juan Latinos, recognized as a distinguished poet. Others of them um, are part of the, the, the Council of Trent, um, the, the famous Roman Catholic uh, council that, that leads to um, what becomes um, the, the, the Catholic Reformation. Um, you also have the fact that right next to St. Peter's Basilica is St. Stephen's Chapel um, that allows for the Ethiopians to have their liturgy engaged. All these things that we won't see during the rise of modern racism, where color will become the distinction, 
where black will become the name of the slave. There are Indians in India that are enslaved. There's Europeans in Eastern Europe are enslaved. But black will become the color of enslavement, in my argument, with the rise of modern racism. So I think the challenge for me is, what did Christianity look like prior to modern racism so that we can better understand how we are so shaped by race today that we can't see race even when it's not there? Dr. Wallace, would you like to address that? No, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so for, for, for people following us, the, there, there are two things I heard as, remember, the question is, why is Northern Africa viewed as Southern Europe? And we heard two R's, revisionist history. Mm -hmm. So we've made these African fathers and mothers and martyrs from black to white in our imagery. Uh, but, but then also a, a rejection of the Imago Dei in them and essentially racism, so maybe that's three R's. I, I want to do a follow-up on that. Uh, what, was the, what was the method of the whitewashing of Christianity? So we, we, we mentioned well, three here, three R's, but what, what was the method to get us to this point? Because again, it does have evangelistic effects. People are rejecting Christ as a result of misinformation presented as fact. I think that sometimes we get mad, and hear me to the, like, I'll say this, we sometimes get upset when we see white depictions of Jesus. And what we need to understand is that in every single culture into which Christianity goes, China, Japan, Sub-Saharan Africa, they all make Jesus to look like them. That is part of what it means to be art. You want God who looks like you. The difference is the Ethiopian Jesus or the Japanese Jesus didn't go and colonize people and then plant that Jesus in front of colonized people. So in other words, like the Ethiopian Jesus is still in Ethiopia. He's not running around everywhere else. And so what happened then... Yeah, the white Jesus was on good time. White Jesus was everywhere. Mm -hmm. so, so, so what happens is now, now you have yourself in a context in which there are black people with the blonde and blue-eyed Jesus. And then in our context, it goes into film. Um, and then everybody in Egypt is white. And then, like, most everybody. And so you get this place where people then get conscious, and they say, well, biblical scholars do the exact same thing. They effectively make the, the standards for having black characters in the Bible, in the scholarship, really high. And then you have this place where black people are running around trying to find themselves in biblical text and trying to recover our history. And so part of it is an, a, the impact of colonialization, not just those depictions, because, like, you can go, in my house, we had black Jesus and white Jesus on the same wall. And we never even tried to reconcile them. It was my mom's way of trying to balance those things out. But I don't think the instinct of like a guy in Italy to paint Jesus looking Italian was bad. It's the fact that that guy then went and colonized people and then said that this God who you're looking at is the one who told me to do it. Yeah, just, and just to build off of that, um, yeah, I would say he, 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 you're right. I mean, he painted that white Jesus, um, you know, in order to, uh, show that, you know, I'm made in God's image as well. But the other part of it, and this is where I do have to say, I think we can't only blame this on the modern period, that even in antiquity, there was a belief that blackness equated sin and depravity and that whiteness. So that painter and, and all the painters that painted him were white, uh, it, they also were doing it with the belief that God and Jesus could only be white because white equals purity. And again, that goes back to the Tanhuma Midrash where you have the curse of Ham. People think the curse of Ham was invented by in the modern period. No, that goes back to like late antique fourth century Jewish Midrash where they said that Ham's was cursed when it was actually Canaan and all of his black progeny are cursed. And then that's repeated by Islamic medieval historians all throughout the seven, eight, nine, ten hundreds. So these, these anti-black sentiments are in white Christianity, European Christianity, Judaism and Islam in the medieval and in the late antique period uh, from the very beginning. That's how it became whitewashed because to, to your point, Esau, that yes, and it goes back to what I was saying earlier, God intended uh, to communicate the reality that all people are accepted in the body of Christ and that all of us are made in God's image. So therefore in, a, in an ideal world, all of us can paint Jesus looking like us. Uh, and that did happen. In fact, uh, the Mogao Caves in China, you have an image of Jesus looking Chinese, and that's amazing. But the sad reality is because of sin, white folks grabbed a hold of that white image of Jesus and said, no, this is the only way he can look. And that's a process that, yes, the way it looked in the modern period, was it the same as in antiquity? No, not exactly. But it's cer there's certainly traces in the foundations of it. And in Multitude of All Peoples, I go through a three-step process that I'll say very quickly. But the first of it was that before the fourth century, uh, to your point, Christianity was a global religion. It was not associated with any one 
particular people group. It was in the Persian Empire, it was in India, it was all over Arabia, it was in Ethiopia, Nubia, North Africa, it was in Europe. It was a global faith. It was not associated with any one culture. In the fourth century, Constantine allegedly becomes a Christian, and that is when Christianity became seen as, oh, that's a Roman religion now. It was never seen that way before. In fact, if anything, the Roman Empire was the main empire persecuting people. In the 200s, it was safer to be a Christian in Iraq and Iran and Afghanistan, which was the Persian Empire, than it was in Rome or Italy or Greece, which was the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire. But when Constantine appropriates Christianity and Roman Christians began to articulate theology in Greek Hellenistic terms only and began to depict Jesus as being later on in the European period looking white only, that, that's the beginning of that process. The second notch in that is the Council of Chalcedon, which is a council we need to start talking about a lot more. The Council of Chalcedon was the moment in 451 where the dominant church of the Roman Empire articulated Christology in a way that suited Hellenistic thinking and language that talked about Jesus being one person but two physicists uh, uh, and, and in ways and concepts that did not equate to Persian or Ethiopian language and they condemned as heretics the Christians of Africa and Asia and the Middle East that is a schism that lasted even to this day uh, and then the third step of that is after the rise of Islam those same Christianities became deeply diminished in their own lands and European Christian the, the rise of Islam also weakened the Roman empire, it, it really effectively ended uh, the Eastern Byzantine Empire's control of the Mediterranean. That's when power shifted further north and further west into the Holy Roman Empire. And that's when that Christian world emerged, which would later go into the Crusades, which would later go into transatlantic slave trade. That, And then it, you could build a scholasticism and, and then go into a new world that completely forgot about or erased uh, because they had already condemned them as heretics ever since 451. So ironically, colonists, when they went out and conquered the world, they did not just encounter unchristian people in Africa and the Americas and South Asia. They also, the Portuguese also came to India and they found Christians that had been there for a thousand years and they colonized them and they said, you're not real Christians because you don't have, and that went back to 451. And they went into Ethiopia and they said, you're not real Christians because you, you didn't uh, accept the Council of Chalcedon. And so that's that's the like kind of the short history of how it became whitewashed. Yeah, I want to I want I want you guys to address the impact of that. Over 50 years ago, uh, Tom Skinner wrote "How Black Is the Gospel," and so he was he was addressing some of the same things we're still talking about now here in 2021. What are some of the effects of this whitewashing of Christianity and Africa? What are some of the effects that we see of this? Well, the effects are seen in our theology in our church, how we look at ourselves, how we look at our people. Um, how we interpret the text. I'm, I'm not a scholar, uh, I'm a preacher. And one of, the, one of the challenges, why do we place so much emphasis on the Acts 10 material and we disregard the Acts 8 material? Acts 10 because so big, because Cornelius is brought to Christ. But then the Acts 8 material is when the Ethiopian eunuch uh, is brought. And then the Ethiopian eunuch and, and the way they interpret that story. So we've got a bunch of uh, sisters named Candace when in fact it was really Candace. And Candace was a queen of queens. And they interpreted eunuch and see slave when we see a secretary of treasuries. Uh, we see someone very powerful and we see so there's this huge story about the beginnings of the gospel and, and the humanity and the ability and agency of black people that is totally downplayed. And then this other story is lifted up. What that causes is then uh, our churches are viewed. And some of this conference is even dealing with some of that stuff. Um, some people running over to white churches because they thought they would get more word and they thought they would get more word because we've been told it's their book and they interpret it right and we don't interpret it right. So, and those are the effects so that uh, when the old black preacher preaches, somehow he's ignorant. Mm. And that's an effect. So that when they suggest that you approach a text with the social grammatical approach to scripture where you ask about the sits and leave and then after you ask about the sits and leave and you ask who is talking and to whom are they talking and then what did they say and what would the original hearers have heard it and then you conserve that and ask what did the church say but then we as black people came along and we said well we don't just conserve we confront 
So after we've asked those other questions, we confront and say, why does that say that? But because of all of this other whitewashing, when we say anything, it's looked at with a jaundiced eye. Therefore, what we have to do is not, again, as I was arguing, we have to normalize the conversation, except that we are black and we have agency and we are smart and we are capable and we are in the book and we are not, we don't define ourselves in relationship to whiteness. We are complete in ourselves. All of that wrestling match, the fact that we're having this conversation is the effect of the whitewashing. I'm sure there's not a white convention somewhere asking about black folk and why are they having this conversation or how can we do, and so at some point, we're going to have to throw off colonization by stop defining ourselves by white people or in comparison to white people, mm -hmm. but stand on our own feet. The, thank you, Dr. Walla. And, and if you're hearing snaps, that's a millennial amen. That's what that's- what Amen. That that's a millennial <laughs> amen. Do, Dr. Daines, would you like to address that at all? Yeah, okay. Uh, you, you say this, I wanna, I wanna quote an article that you actually contributed for the Jew3 con, uh, uh, Jew project. You say this, the historians John Thornton, Linda Haywood, and others have convinced me at least that amongst the 20 plus Africans who were illegally transported to the Virginia colony included Christians. The evidence includes a 1619 letter written by a local Roman Catholic bishop, Manuel Batista, in which he expressed his outrage that the 4,000 plus African Christians from Dongo in West Central Africa had been captured by slave traders. Uh, so this next question is this, C can, you, can you break down and give us, uh, are, are there examples of Christi Christians and Christianity in West Africa before the transatlantic slave trade? Appreciate that. Um, so, so the first thing I think the issue was that it was very, very clear that there were, Christian, there were blacks who were Christians in the northeast part of Africa, which wasn't where the slave trade, transatlantic slave trade was. And so therefore, even if one wanted to concede that historically one had the problem, did Africans who came over to North America encounter Christianity for the first time on the slave plantation? Mm -hmm. And so the work of these scholars have helped me understand that no, there were already Africans who are Christian, mm -hmm. who, are, who have been Christian on the Atlantic side of um, the ocean, uh, African part, um, at least as early in a consistent way um, as 1490 or so. So that's before Christopher Columbus, and that's before, um, obviously, then the transatlantic slave trade. That church, which is the key church, there, there, there are Christians in Bari, and there's Christians um, where Nigeria is, there's Christians uh, in Benin, also where Nigeria is. Um, there are also some Christians a little further north in Senegambia. But the continuous community um, was the one in the Congo. And it was not only content, continuous, but it was one, to my amazement, as John Thornton and others said, that by 16, 15, 16, I'm sorry, they open up a school system that has over 1,000 students who are learning to read and to write. Um, and, and, and they're educating men and women. Europeans aren't doing that for the most part in any systematic way um, in 1516, but these Congolese Christians were. Um, and then King Afonso um, believed that we should be like the church in Europe, which means we should have a bishop. Um, just like they have. And so therefore he pushed for it. The Portuguese were against it, um, but the Pope agreed with them. And so they consecrated his son, Enrique. And so, and, and then they planned to open up a college in 1560s that they aren't able to open till about 1620. Um, and so you have this literate class, um, you have book culture um, already in the Congo in the 1500s. And so it's out of that population, that larger population that um, uh, Linda Hayward, John Thornton, and others are saying that on that slave ship that arrives in 1619 mm. are Christians. Why might that be significant? Because that might mean that it is not the Great Awakening that brought Africans to Christianity. It is not a preacher on a slave plantation that brought Africans to Christianity, but it's Congolese Christians who were forced over here, but, but, but they were Christian when they were, got on the boat and they were Christians when they got off the boat. And so when one then looks not at Virginia, but when one looks at New, what becomes New York, the Dutch colony, you will see by the 1630s, there are Africans who are 
probably of Congolese descent who are part of the church there um, in what becomes New York. Um, they, they become free um, by uh, 1650. They become landholders by 1560s. Um, and, and, and out of that, there, there are African Christians who are there. If you recall, in 1640s, in the legislature in Maryland, there is a person of African descent who's a legislator um, who's there who is also a Christian. And then there are Christians not only in Virginia, but there's Christians in low country South Carolina. And so therefore, it looks like to me, just to me, based on that evidence, that they are the ones that do the first evangelizing and that they are evangelizing a Christianity that's not a slave religion, Right. Um, their evangel Christianity that is based upon the fact that there's a school system, you're educated, there's college. It's based on text and not merely on morality. That's right. That's wow. Right. Dr. McCullough, that's awesome. I, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but one of the things, if we're going to recover all of this stuff, we've talked about orthodoxy and the Roman Catholic Church. And what actually we're talking about without saying it, it was actually was destroyed during the transatlantic slave trade with yeah. the liturgical heritage of African Christianity. That's right. And if you go back looking at your roots, I know no Baptist is going to amen that, but it's true. If you go back and look at the roots of African Christianity, it was deeply liturgical. But if you go back and you actually listen to that stuff, it's not liturgical in its European form. It's liturgical with a little bit of soul to it. And so if you want to go back and recover mm -hmm. like African Christianity, be careful. Um, because you might end up with some liturgy in your services. But I'm just glad that y'all mentioned that. <laughs> I'll leave it alone after that, but I'm just telling y'all the truth. Oh, yeah. but, 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 but I, I want right. to say, though, the first black, again, using your, your formula, the first Africans who are Protestant um, goes to as early as 1560 with Lusitano, um, Vicente Lusitano, who was an Afro-Portuguese Roman Catholic priest who converts to Protestantism by the late 1550s, ends up in Wartenberg. I can't pronounce it right, yeah. W-U-R-R-E-M. Somewhere um, in Germany. But, but he, he ends up there. Um, but then you have the first group by 1590s in London who convert to Protestantism um, there um, um, during the time, time that's there. And, and you have Protestants who are there. So, so, so by 1600, you already have people of African descent on the Orthodox side, the Catholic side, and the Protestant side. Dr. Bantu, and yep. then we'll go to our last question and open it up. Yeah, no, no, for sure. Um, yeah, um, I would say, uh, just echoing a lot of what was said, um, you know, and I got to give a shout out. Where's Pastor Mace? Where you at, brother? It's dark. Where you at? My man. Um, I got to give a shout out to Pastor Mace because Pastor Mace asked me to address this question at Frequency a few years ago. And, and, and I gave a workshop where I was just like, well, all I know of is Basically, I presented the, uh, not as well, but I presented the information that Dr. Dan was just talking about, the history of the Congo, powerful history uh, of Christian, uh, uh, an African nation that freely adopted Christianity under King Nzinga Mbemba in the 15, 1500s and was a Christian nation for 300 years. And Doña Beatriz Kempavita is a powerful prophetess in Congo, whose name we need to know, who started a powerful movement where she was trying to kick out uh, you know, Portuguese and Belgian colonization in the Congo. Uh, and as, we, as Dr. Daniel said, some of us were already Christians when we got here. And one of, the, one of the biggest slave revolts in US history, the Stono Rebellion in 1739 in South Carolina, was started by Congolese Christians who spoke French and were already Christians when they got here. So the gospel of Jesus Christ gave African slaves in the Americas the sense of freedom to fight for their freedom. They, they rallied a bunch of other African Americans and, and were making their way to Florida. Uh, and so it's a powerful history. Um, one thing that, that uh, doc, uh, but one thing I was wondering about, that was all I knew at the time. And uh, I was curious though about, because the, re the sad reality is still that even though it was independently accepted, it still came from Europeans. And as Dr. Daniels mentioned, there was a sense in which they had to try to emulate and emulate, even Dona Beatrice called herself like the reincarnation of St. Anthony of Padua. And so there was a highly European. Now, it was contextualized too. There was a lot of, if you look at the crucifixes and different things, that came from there. It was a mix of Congolese and European Christianity. But, you know, somebody could say that still came from Europe, though. It didn't come from West Africa. So it made me wonder, okay, you had all this Christianity in North Africa and in East Africa, uh, you know, North Africa, Egypt, Nubia, Ethiopia. Did any of that make its way into West and Central Africa? As I mentioned earlier, it was largely because of the oppression of European Christianity that it didn't. And so we never have to, you know, uh, forget that. But did it make it? And I am, I was so shocked to find out that it indeed did. And that there is actually Muslim 
historical records that show that Christianity also didn't only come in from West Africa through Europeans, but it also came, because also those Congolese were also trading slaves with the Portuguese as well uh, in the slave castles. So that Congolese Christian kingdom was participating in the transatlantic slave trade. But there were indigenous African Christians who had the, the historic, I mean, I think Negro spirituals and gospels liturgical too, but I, I give it to me. But they, they, there, were, there were East Africans that had that orthodox original uh, African Christianity, the soulful, I mean, you want to talk about soul, you, you get the Debteras, that's some soulful liturgical African music right there, or Saint Yared, but that Christianity did make its way into West and Central Africa already start, just through migration, because we talk about the transatlantic slave trade, but we also have to talk about the trans-Saharan slave trade, and the trans-Saharan also trade that's of right. spices and salt, and also, so through that, from Nubia, mainly Nubia, Christianity, there is historical records from historians like Ibn Khaldun, al Makrizi, and I, I'm working on an article on this right now to put it all together, and God is so good, because you know, it was at the same time that Pastor Mays asked me this question that I was actually in the process of learning a classical Arabic and I just finished learning it. So now I can slowly read these texts and like translate them and stuff. And I found this, the, the best one, I had to put it on Facebook, but the article ain't out yet, but I had to put this one on Facebook because I just wanted everybody to know. There is a historian from the early 1300s, uh, th 1300s uh, from Egypt. His name is Ibn al-Dawadari. And he talked to Mansa Musa in the 1300s, who was the king of Mali, which is not the modern nation of Mali, but it was basically all of West Africa. Uh, and he actually traveled, he was a Muslim, he traveled over to Mecca to make his pilgrimage, and he stopped in Egypt, and he talked to this historian, Ibn al-Dawadawi, who wrote down in his history that Mansa Musa said that there was an entire Christian section of his kingdom. Now, this is 1300, so this is over a, a century and a half before the, ki the kingdom of the Congo became Christian, and before any Europeans ever came to the West African coast, that Mansa Musa said there were Christians in his kingdom, and not only that, but the air, he, he was the richest person in the world because he controlled the gold trade. And not only that, but the Christian region of Mali, uh, which would have been, you know, Ghana, uh, Senegal, uh, you know, parts of Nigeria, that the Christian section is actually the one that controlled the most of the gold trade. And in fact, he even said that when the Muslims tried to overtake the, that section to control the gold trade, the gold stopped growing. It stopped producing. And so they left them alone and allowed the Christians to control the gold rich areas of the Mali kingdom, which is West Africa. So uh, I didn't know that when you asked me. So, you know, but, uh, but uh, just, yeah, praise God to know the answer is yes, it most certainly did. But not only, because I have to just echo so much what Pastor Allen just said. We have to stop defining ourselves by how much we measure up to our by white standards. And we have to look at historical records and, and African history on our own accord, right? One of the things that bothers me a little bit about when we as black people recover African history is we only do it to the degree to which it influenced Western or white Christianity. That we will say, well, how did African Christianity influence Western Christianity? And I'm like, okay, yeah, let's talk about that. But I don't really, African, African history is not only valuable in as far as it was influential or uh, it made its way into Western or white history. African history and African African civilizations are valuable in and of themselves and in their own right. So it was really powerful to me to learn of the fact that Christianity made its way into West Africa and it came from other Africans. Thank you. Yeah. Go. Yeah. Yeah. What's up, everyone? Lisa Fields here, and I'm so excited about our new curriculum, Courageous Conversations. You heard about our popular conference, Courageous Conversations, where we invite the leading pastors, thought leaders, and scholars from conservative and progressive backgrounds for conversations. But we not only want to have those conversations on stage at the conference, but we want you to have them in your everyday life. So we developed a curriculum for you to do just that. Courageous Conversations curriculum, the tools you need for the conversations and culture. You can get that today on Amazon or on our website at ju3project.org. Listen, um, so here's our last one before we begin to take in your questions. And, I, I, and, and Dr. McCauley, I want to refer to chapter five of your book, Reading While Black, that you call Black and Proud. And you say this, the first encounter with Jesus, we are told, came from those who wanted us docile and accepting of our earthly status while we waited for the sucker in the world to come. Black Christianity, for some, is an oxymoron because the Christian story is not ours. It is a fact hiding in plain sight that the three major centers of early, African, early Christianity were patriarchs of Rome, Antioch, and Alexandria. So here's our last question, Dr. McCauley, I want you to start. How do we decolonize? Because the, the reality is we have a lot of black people who have a colonized view of their own history 
and even the continent of Africa. How do we decolonize our view of Africa? Um, I'm not sure if I can answer that particular question well, but I may say something about how we deal with the relationship between African Christianity and what happened here in America. I think that we can recover Africa and African Christianity, uh, and that's important, but at a certain point we have to deal with the trauma of what happened with being black in America. And Christianity was used against black people, and Christianity did do harm. And recovering that African Christianity doesn't actually undo that harm. And there's a lot of black people who I think, if I'm reading the culture well, who are trying to make sense of how can I be Christian now when I'm trying to follow Jesus and I know that Jesus has done these horrible things. People have done these horrible things in the name of, of, of Jesus. And if I can say one thing to that particular group of people, one way of doing it is kind of an apologetic way. Look, Christianity existed before all of this stuff happened. We've talked about that for an hour. But also I think that what I see happening is even when people come to grips with that reality, that history, they just choose too often a different form of whiteness. So if they turn from evangelicalism to European um, process theology, you still just traded one filter of Christianity for another. And I think that whether it's in Africa or whether it's in Europe, there is something called Christianity. There is something about the death and resurrection and return of Jesus that is true and compelling to the person. And so I would say what we need to be able to recover is the fact that that truth about what Christianity is has taken root in a lot of places. One of those places is Africa. And if that helps us to function as Christians, then that's well and good. Um, but I still think that even after you've recovered with that, that you've recovered that truth, you still have to deal with the trauma. Because we all have, we talked about the last session, we have these wounds of what the church has done to us. And we have to find a way to kind of find Jesus in, in the ruins. And if one of the places you find him is either recovering of African spirituality, then or African Christianity, then that, that's fine. But I still think we can never get, we can never lose sight of the thing itself, which is the gospel that compels us. And if it's important to us to hear, which is true, that, that gospel has compelled black people for thousands of years, then go ahead and recover it. Well, I appreciate the the work of Carl Ellis, and he talks about Christianity-ism. You know, there's, there's a Christianity-ism that was given to the black community in an attempt to erase everything that we've been talking about. But it didn't erase it all. And there's something in the experience of Christianity through an Afro-sensitive lens that we have to hear and that can heal. You know, when, when we think about, when I think about, I am a conservative Christian if I have to use that language as probably some of the people in this room are, but because I view my Christianity through a Afro-sensitive lens, at 50,000 feet in the air, if you put me in the room with a evangelical or someone and ask us a theological question, we probably answer it the same way. But when we get on the ground, it looks very different yeah. in how you live it out. Yeah. And that has to do with me being African and the community that I come from informed by a deep love for community and a deep understanding that was not killed. And so I think the effects of that um, how we have to own that there is a particular way to read scripture with an Afro, I don't use Afrocentric because I'm Christocentric, only one thing in the middle, but I read it through an African lens. And I can land in places that are more egalitarian. Uh, I can land in places that build and don't seek to dominate and destroy and build hierarchies from the same text that they tried to use because I'm African. And, and that's what I think we're getting at. And so we who do this hard work of reading the scripture and studying history have to ask in all of these eras, what did it look like to be African? What did it look like to be black? And I keep coming back with there is 
something more than the individualistic Christianity, I'm saved and going to heaven anyhow in the Bible, then, then and, and the African story helps us with that. I'm reminded of this, when Cornelius got the story, his household came to Christ. But when the Ethiopian eunuch got it, the whole community came to Christ. There's something about what it means to be African that you don't keep it for yourself. And there's something about being black that says this thing isn't just for me, it's for all my people. And when I read every text that way, I come out with something very different than they give you at Southern or Truett or anything else. And so I, I, I own that. I'm a graduate of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. I was there for the conservative takeover in 1990, and I saw the ugliness of it. And I'm committed to the book, but I'm committed to the book as, 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 as our African fathers gave it to us. And as my granddaddy gave it to us, that grandfather who couldn't read or write, but somehow could get at the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Daniels, you'd like to answer that before we... Yeah, I, I want to say amen, amen, and <laughs> amen again. Um, so so I, I already gave away my, my card, which is, um, I think the damage we're suffering under is because of modern racism. Um, I think the, again, um, there are there are theologians from there are theologian philosophers from Erasmus to Luther who are quoting Ethiopian um, Christians. Did Karl Barth do that? Did Paul Tillich do that? Mm. Did, 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 did Hodges, which is H A A Hodge? I mean, I, I, modern racism truncated their vision, mm. even in a way. I don't deny that 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 discrimination existed and a whole bunch of things. That, but, the, but I, I see something different. I mean, what, what letter of recommendation did Bart or Calvin, or not Calvin, Bart or Tillich, or give, give me the great theologians of the, of the modern period, which is modern racism. When did they light a letter, a letter of recommendation? Um, so so I, 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 think, I think something was different then. So I think decolonizing is somehow trying to figure out how do we realize how we're shaped by modern racism, mm -hmm. and then figure out how we can envision a world, a church, and a reading of the Bible that's after modern racism. And the way that I'm suggesting is that we look at pre-rise of modern racism to struggle. It's not all perfect, but we're struggling to do that. And I, I agree with you on the reference, um, so I, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm partly guilty, but the reason why I like Northrop's book about how Africa discovered Europe, because for so long, I was always told we were passive. We were the object, and, Af and Europe was the only one that was active. And so I like the reversal. I agree with you. The reversal is not sufficient in and of itself. We need to have Africa for its own integrity um, that's there. And so I think all of that is part of the decolonizing. But, but, but I don't think until we realize how deep we have been shaped by modern racism can we figure out how to move beyond it. And, and, and what I don't mean is merely slave trade. Um, the war on poverty, the war on drugs destroyed black families in the last 30, 40 years, and possibly the gains we made by 1960, many of them are lost because of what happened. And why did that happen? I want to say it's the latest iteration of modern racism. Thank you so much. We want to move into uh, the, the questions you guys sent in, and this one has a lot of votes. Uh, this question says this, and, and anyone can take a stab at it first. Uh, can you interact with Willie James Jennings' work on suppressionism as it relates to representing Jesus in one's own culture versus preserving his Jewish identity and welcoming all of the cultures in it? I think they might have been supersessionism. Yeah, super, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's the New Testament, I can do that. Um, <laughs> Well, it's precisely as Jesus is Jewish that he goes to the rest of the world. The de-Jewishness of Jesus was a, sorry, I feel like all I do is yell at Germans, but they did it, they got to hold the L. Um, so the de-Jewishness of Jesus is one manifestation of um, German liberalism. And the idea was in order for Jesus to become universal, he had to become yes, less Jewish. And so Christianity goes from being a part of an exclusive religion, Judaism, to a universal religion, what becomes Christianity. But what actually is going on in the text of the New Testament is they're saying that the vision of the Jewish scriptures, this is 
Genesis 12. God's going to use Abraham's people to bless the world. And that God says to Abraham from the beginning, you're going to, be, you're going to have children from every family and every ethnic group on the world. And so Jesus, as the Davidic king, has by definition in view all the ethnic groups in the world. And so it is precisely Jesus as the Jewish Messiah that you get a picture of the worldwide people of God gathered from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And so you don't have to make Jesus less of who he is to be universal. It's him as the Jewish Messiah. He reaches out to the rest of the world. It's the Jesus who is European who then conquers the rest of the world and says you must become like us in order to be a part of that kingdom, which is the exact inverse of what Jesus is doing. And to that end, Paul, who is trying to say that anybody who trusts Jesus is on the team. And so part of it might be recovery of Pauline theology, justification by faith, that allows not ethnic identity or any other marker beyond faith in Christ as sufficient to be a part of God's family. I want, want to add to that. that um, so again, and again, I'm overdoing it, so I apologize to everybody. But you take Zaga Zabo, who's a theologian in Lisbon, really in prison because of the move towards anti-Ethiopianism. But he is arguing he cannot understand this Jesus of the, Europe, of the Roman Catholic Church. Because to him, Jesus and Ethiopia was still Jewish. Because they said when they, they looked at the Council of Acts, um, they didn't give up being Jewish. And so the, Jew, the Ethiopian said the reason why we do circumcision, the reason why um, we have dietary rules, is we're trying to follow the first century church. And so, so therefore, the Europeans were forced in that debate. It's sort of a new re, the new Paul from, uh, um, that, that, that came out in the 1960s with, with Stendhal and others. The Ethiopians were already arguing that in Europe in the 1500s. Th that to me is part of the recovery. Because then we can say that, that Stendhal didn't even realize he is merely echoing a discussion from centuries before. It's a much larger conversation as to whether or not what becomes the new reading of Paul, this is in an African American context, wasn't already in the black church from the beginning. Because if you read something like Jesus and the Disinherited, who he's talking about the Jewishness of Jesus over against the Europeanness of Jesus, and that comes into modern biblical scholarship and becomes a new perspective on Paul when black pastors in their churches were talking about King Jesus and David and the importance of the Davidic promises the entire time. But that's a conversation for another day. Yeah, no, um, but I, I would say um, that, and I'm, I'm, I just got through writing a review on Jennings' new book, uh, After Whiteness, and it's in our Hymeno journal. And so shout out Beecham School of Hymeno. We have the uh, only black biblical graduate level seminary. That's part of what we're doing is that's how we decolonize our faith or not even decolonizing, but also getting into our colonial theology. Like I, that's why I love Ethiopian Christianity uh, and getting into that because that's part of our work is again, seeing Du Bois uh, said that it's impossible for us to not see through the veil. And I respectfully disagree. I think it is possible for us to see who we are in Christ Jesus as black people, not merely as, again, just to echo what was said, not merely as simply a response to whiteness. And so I think that, um, you know, I think that's part of how we do that work. And and yeah, with, with Jennings' work, I would also say that I think that he's, him and Carter in, in race theological account are in a way going to the opposite extreme of what uh, Dr. McCauley was just saying, where you had this move of stripping or trying to decenter or like kind of move Jesus out of his Hebraic Jewish uh, Palestinian roots and in white Christianity. I think they're wrong by rooting that in like Gnosticism though, because Gnosticism wasn't normative for Western Christianity, but racism and white supremacy was from the fourth century following. Uh, but I think their motive are, is right. So I think they're off a little bit there on the late antique part. Um, but I also think that they go to, to another extreme where there's, uh, what Jennings literally says, and I engage with him also in Multitude of All Peoples in the conclusion, where he's uh, basically saying that we are now second readers after Israel. And I'll say, well, no, I think what Paul says in Galatians 3.28 is that there is no first or second reader, but that all of us are uh, equally, you know, we are African. We don't have to go to the other extreme and say we have to put ourselves, as Jennings says, put ourselves into Israel's story. Like, we don't have to put ourselves into that. We are African people and people of African descent. And again, you know, we have this uh, debate debate about, you know, that goes back to, you know, the sociologists from the 40s and 50s, the Franklin and Herskovitz about, are we actually African or are we basically just dark-skinned Americans and we lost everything African? And I respectfully fall on the side of that that says, you know, we're not from Africa, but we are people of African descent and you can't be around people from the continent and see the foods. I was just watching High on the Hog too, and see the dance moves and see the ways, the 
rhythms and then look at the black church and say that there's nothing African in the ways in which African Americans live and breathe and function. And that doesn't need to be some kind of imitation of Israel, not a rejection of Jesus's Hebrew roots either, uh, but also that's a, a part of Sankofa going back and connecting to even our, our colonial roots as well. Mm -hmm. I want to move into the next one. This got several votes. Uh, did African Christians in history have a different view of spiritual beings and evil powers than what we have in American Christianity today? And, and just so, so people can understand the question, some of the perspective that African spirituality viewed everything as metaphysical um, as opposed to necessarily literal evil or, or whatever. So I think that's what they may be getting at. Dr. Bantu, I think you were going to respond. No, I was going to say abs uh, absolutely, although I would say that in the rise of Pentecostalism, both in the diaspora and on the continent, I think we're seeing a return or a Sankofa a a coming back to in many ways. But, but yeah, uh, many black people in the diaspora have received Christianity through European colonialism and so in so doing have kind of adopted a spirituality that in many ways is more Western and European and not connected to African roots. But yes, it clear, it most definitely ancient African Christians did engage and view the spiritual world uh, in a way that was uh, very different than what we see today. Egyptian Christians were still mummifying. They were still wrapping up their corpses and putting them in temples. Nubian Christians, even though after it became a Nubian temple, were still putting their graves in the mastabas, which was the pre-Christian practice. Uh, you know, the um, the sun was highly venerated, and that's almost like a pan-African religious concept. That even made its way again through the diaspora. The writings of Phyllis Wheatley is known for having a lot of sun veneration, even though she was a Christian. Um, and in fact, Jupiter Hammond uh, critiques her for that. Two of the earliest published African-American writers uh, critiques her, says her writings are too pagan because they have this sun veneration, but you see that in Ethiopian churches where you have, before Christianity, King Izana and his father, they have the sun discs, but even after Christianity, you have churches in Lalibela that have sun images in them, and so there were definitely, I, and again, I mentioned Dipteras. These are basically Christian uh, shamans that, that go around dancing, singing, playing the drums, and casting out demons, and so there's definitely a much more of a, a real sense of the palpable reality of spirits and principalities, uh, even that exists in creation and even in sacred mountains. Uh, the desert was seen as a spiritual place before Christianity, so that's where the Christians built monasteries. So I would say, yes, you definitely do, and those are some examples. Yeah, thank you for that, Dr. Van Tu. Uh, next up is this. It says, how has anti-black uh, anti ideology influenced our biblical anthropology? How has anti-black ideology, ideology influenced, influenced our biblical anthropology? Well, first of all, it causes everyone to look at anything good in the Bible as white. And so we have all, it's influenced our iconography, it's influenced uh, our theology, it's influenced how we, as I was trying to say earlier, um, when we interpret scripture, there's a piece of that puzzle that says we conserve Meaning we ask, what did the first persons who heard it understand it to be? And then we say, what has the church said it means? But we, in the African-American context, confront and will say, why? You know, and, and we ask why. Uh, for instance, why is Mary Magdalene, her, why is her sin always sexual? There's nothing that says it was sexual. We've just allowed white men to read into it that it's sexual. Why on the Isle of Malta, where all the words available to the commentators, did they choose barbarians? And so everything that is evil, everything that is wrong becomes black or female. Uh, everything that is good and everything that is strong is white and male. And then that is handed down to us. Even down to, it seemed, I, I don't know, but I heard in the question when we were talking about the Jewishness of Jesus, why is ethnicity always polarizing? Why do I have to give up ethnicity to become universal? Isn't it possible that we can be fully black and for the world? Isn't it possible that Jesus can be fully, fully Jewish and died for everyone? But it seems that in this present context, that the only person that, the only people that are allowed to be fully themselves and for everyone because they feel entitled to it is when you're white. 
And so that, that's the stuff that we wrestle with. That's what anti-black does. It reduces us. It causes us to see the text. It causes us to not see ourselves in good spaces and only see ourselves in bad spaces. And so it is incumbent upon us who then do this work to be unapologetically affirming of ourselves and not in over and against, uh, I, I don't want to take too much time, but that's even when we use the phrase Black Lives Matter. The reason that people then respond back with all lives matter or blue lives matter is because they don't understand that what we're saying is black lives matter too. Not only, but when they say what they're saying, they mean only. And they assume we mean only. That's what it means to be anti-black. And that's the stuff that we have to fight. I hope I'm not in trouble now. No. <laughs> Dr. Daniels, because you, you, you've talked about the effects of racism, so I want you to take a stab at this one first. The question is this, how do we talk to majority white churches, pastors, about the importance of early African Christianity if they won't even listen when it comes to racism? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I must apologize. I'm from the generation that is tired of educating. So we've spent the last, you know, I don't know, go start with the boys trying to educate. So now it's their turn to educate themselves. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That's it. That's it. Here we go. We're we're pressed for time. <laughs> no, no, no. I, right. I agree. What, what's 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 the distinct difference? between black Hebrew Israelites and Christians discovering there that there are black people in the Bible? What's the difference between those two? I mean, we know there's a variety of Hebrew Israelism, and right. there's even some that I would call brothers and sisters in Christ. And so I think, you know, there's an academic disagreement, and then there's a theological disagreement. The academic or the historical disagreement is that are we Hebrews? Are we actually descendants of the biblical Hebrews? I would say, yeah, probably there's a degree, but as people of the diaspora, we have a we have a lot of ethnicities and a lot of different ancestries that the Middle Passage and the auction block created. And so do some of us have to, yes, because in that research I was just talking about, I've also found some evidence for Hebrews in West and Central Africa, even right. before colonialism. So do some of us have some degree of Hebrew ancestry? Yeah, probably. I would say it's extremely negligible. It's very minimal. Uh, some of us, there's some Christians that made it over we talked about. There's a, there's a lot of Muslims, I would say even more actually Muslims made it over through the Middle Passage. But most of us, most of our ancestors, the overwhelming majority majority of them were practitioners of traditional African religion. They were praying to the Orishas and they were practicing traditional African religion. And so, but even aside from that, if somebody wanted to say, no, I'm a Hebrew, that's my complete ancestor. I'm like, all right, well, I disagree with you. But if they're saying, I believe Jesus lived, rose, died again and rose again, and that he's the only way, truth, and the life, and I just happen to believe that we are Hebrews, but I believe that salvation is open to everyone, then I'm like, okay, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. I disagree with you that we're as, as Hebrew as you think, but, um, but I disagree with that. But then you got Hebrew Israelites that are going further and saying, we're Hebrews and only Hebrews, i.e. black people, and then some variations of Native Americans and Hispanic people, only they can be saved and white people are excluded and that the, the blood only covers certain, only covers mm -hmm. people who are Hebrew. That's when I say, well, now, now you're changing and perverting the gospel, and so we're no longer brothers and sisters of Christ. Yeah. And I would also add, and I'm gonna stay way in my lane, because I don't wanna, don't email me. Um, <laughs> In so much as we want to talk about the manifestation of the Deuteronomic, Deuteronomic curses being visited upon black people through the slave trade, that's just a horrible reading of the Bible. And at a certain point, you just got to say that. That's not what happened to us. Like, we were not enslaved because of anything other than the sinfulness of those who came and enslaved us. It was in no sense of punishment. And I know there's nuances. I just want to say that particular thing is very wrong. We need to say that plainly. Yeah. yeah. I was going to ask, are you when you asked that question, were you referring to the, the religions or the brothers on the corner in Philadelphia? <laughs> that's that's, I, a, whole, I, I that's a whole other discussion. In, uh, yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. I, I, I would say, I, I think the, the distinction okay. they made is a good one. We, we may have time for two, but let's, 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 let's try to tackle this one, gentlemen. There's a perception that European missionaries played a huge role in spreading Christianity in the southern part of Africa. 
how valid is this? Was Christianity dominant before missionaries arrived? Everyone looking at you, Dr. I, was, I, <laughs> I, would, I, would just, I would say, um, I would not say Christianity was dominant in Southern Africa. Uh, you know, it was present. It was, I would say it was one of the major religions, again, before we're talking about, before colonialism, Christianity was one of the major religions in Central and West Africa. It was the, it was the dominant religion in uh, North and East Africa before slavery, before colonialism. In South Africa, to my knowledge, it was not ever a dominant or even a major religion, um, but that's an area that I'm also interested in, so that might be the next one. But I would say that, but then to the other side of the question, were white people a major part, or missionaries a major part of spreading the gospel? of spreading the bisrot of Jesus Christ, the message of liberation and freedom? No, um, but were they hand in hand with soldiers and, col and colonialists? And right. were they kidnapping Zulu and other African people and trying to enforce a particular European expression of Christianity that led into apartheid? Yes, they did that, but I wouldn't call that spreading the gospel. We, we have exactly three minutes. Anyone else want to take a stab at that one? That's All right, I'll, I'll try to get one more in. Um, this question here, uh, what, what resources do we need to look into to find Christians in West Africa before the transatlantic, before the Atlantic slave trade? There, there's material in the Portuguese archives. Um, matter of fact, there, there's a part of Portuguese studies now that is focusing uh, on the relationship between the Congo and Portugal. Um, so, so it's those materials. There's, um, as, um, uh, Cecile Fremont has shown there's both artwork and arts and sources that are there. So, so you have to remember that um, the, the Portuguese were the first Europeans to be along the Atlantic coast um, for probably almost the first century um, going up to 1600. And so they have things in their archives and those things are still being discovered. Um, that's where material is. Um, th there, there's for those of you who do archeology, span there are still archeological remains uh, from Congolese Christianity and the larger area um, that's there from the 1600s and from the 1700s. So th those are still there. And yeah, I would just add to that, um, it was a great resource that I'm going to uh, be looking into myself to learn more. And also I would say, uh, really just read, the, I mean, the oldest African books on the continent were written by Christians in Egypt, Ethiopia, Nubia. Christianity preceded Islam. It preceded, so read these texts. Read the, this material, read the Arabic history of the Patriarchs of Alexandria. It is in e English as well, and it talks about the connections between Christianity in Egypt and in other parts of Africa. Read the history of the monasteries of Nubia and Egypt as well. There's an English translation of that. Read the, the biographies of the Ethiopian text. And the last book I'll say is read a book uh, that is called, I forget exactly what it is, it's something like Arabic Sources for the History of West African History. That's a, a chronicle of Muslim historical text from like the eighth up until the 14th century in English translation that tells the history of Christianity. I mean, tells the history of Africa and it includes Christianity a lot in there. Dr. McCauley, last one. I'm just gonna encourage you all to buy these two brothers books on the end here and the stuff that they write because we, they do a lot of work that doesn't get, it's easy to write a book about John or Jesus. Y'all could buy that in a minute, but this brother does something like the multitude of peoples and y'all didn't buy it like y'all should have. And so if you want to support this kind of work, sign up for their classes, invite them to your churches. And they, this material needs to be there. And the people who are dedicating their lives to doing this kind of work deserve the kind of platform. So I want to encourage you all. Yeah. Amen. To think about having these people come and, and keep having your revivals. I'm not like, do all of that. Um, but then, like, have, have these brothers and sisters um, yeah. come to your, your churches and just teach the people. Because these yeah. are facts that are hiding in plain sight. And those of you, and I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, you're not going to make any money doing it. So you got to make sure Jesus tells you to do this. But some of y'all needs to pick up the, the, the they're leaving this, this trail. And there needs to be another generation of scholars who pick that trail up. And continue that work and can do the work of making it accessible to the people. Dr. McCauley, thank you so much. Gentlemen, thank you for this rich conversation. Will you give these gentlemen a hand? Thank you so much. 
What's up everybody? This is Lisa Fields, the founder and president of the Jude 3 Project. And I'm so excited to come to you to talk about Courageous Conversations 2022. That's right, we're at it again for another year. The theme this year is the scholar and the skeptic. We're back in Washington, DC at National Community Church with seven amazing conversations. Conversations like, is there a God? Should we trust the Bible? Is Christianity a white man's religion? Does Christianity oppress women? Is Christianity homophobic and transphobic? Should we be spiritual or religious? Is Christianity bad for our mental health? We want to give you a blueprint on how to have courageous conversations with gentleness and respect. Remember, we sold out last time, so make sure you register early and get your ticket now. If you can't join us in person, you have the virtual option as well, but don't miss this year. Register today at CourageousCombos.org.